hello, good evening. I am Miraklis Katsaloudis. I work at EKT, the, the National Documentation Center of Greece. And I am a, a member of the Triple Project team. So I would like to welcome you all in this um, webinar, this training webinar, uh, which is dedicated uh, to, on, to the linked data. Uh, the exact title, as you can see, is the linked data ecosystem for SSH and a case study from the cultural uh, heritage domain. This uh, webinar is organized by EKT in uh, the context of work package eight of the triple project. Uh, the triple project, uh, triple acronym stands for transforming research through innovative practices for a linked inter interdisciplinary exp exploration. Uh, the triple project was launched in October 2019. It develops the Go Triple Discovery Platform, which will be one of the dedicated services of OPERAS. OPERAS is the research infrastructure supporting open scholarly communication in the social sciences and humanities in the European uh, research area. Now, the Go Triple platform is an innovative multilingual and multicultural discovery solution for the social sciences and humanities. It will provide the central access point that allows users to explore, find access, and reuse materials such as literature, data, projects, and researchers' profiles at, uh, at a European scale. Uh, now, uh, for, for the Greek audience, I have to say here that uh, in the middle of December, we are organizing here in EKT um, a webinar that will be dedicated to, to the Go Triple platform. Uh, so we are going to, to explore the, the structure of the platform and how it operates. It, you will be notified uh, very shortly, so please uh, stay tuned. So regarding uh, today's webinar, I want to inform you that this session will be recorded and it will be made available so that it, it can be made available afterwards. Uh, we're going to have two presentations and uh, we will have time for discussion at the end after the presentations. So uh, questions are more than welcome. You can put them in the chat. I will take care of, collect, of collecting them and presenting them to uh, our speakers. So we're going to have two presentations. Um, the first one will be by uh, Manolis Peponakis, who will introduce the basic concepts of linked data and will explain us why linked data are particularly uh, suitable for social sciences and uh, humanities. Now, uh, Manolis is an information professional at the National Documentation Center in EKT here. He holds an MSc in information science, a bachelor degree in social anthropology, and another one in librarianship and information system. He is a PhD candidate in the domain of knowledge representation, focusing on modeling sociocultural information for the semantic web. Uh, the last couple of years, he teaches uh, knowledge representation as an ANSAC lecturer at the University of West Africa. The second presentation will be made by Agathe Papanotti. She will focus on searchculture.gr, the Greek cross-domain cultural data aggregator, as a state-of-the-art case for the use of uh, linked data in the cultural domain. Agathe is an archaeologist with uh, an MA in Arts and Heritage Management. She has been working uh, for AKT since 2007 as an information specialist. She has worked on the development of EKT's content management and organization services, and in particular, EKT's digital repositories, and on the development of the national aggregator of cultural content, searchculture.gr, as well as semantics.gr, a platform for publishing semantic resources. Since 2015, she has been responsible for a rinsic uh, content aggregated in searchculture.gr and openarchives.gr aggregators. 
Now I would like for my, my part, from my side, to thank both of uh, the speaker for accepting the invitation to participate in this webinar, to participate in this webinar and give us two uh, very interesting talks. I'm uh, pretty sure for, for this. So without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and I will give the floor to Manolis Peponakis. Thank you all for, for being here. Thank, thank you so. all. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for attending this uh, webinar. Uh, the following presentation is a brief introduction to linked data, aiming to outline their potential, their dynamics in the field of uh, social science and humanities. I thought it uh, would be better to focus on a more abstract and more uh, theoretical level, illustrated by some examples, and uh, discussing uh, what linked data are and how can they contribute for the social science and the humanities. So there is no code, there is no programming or something uh, like this in uh, this presentation. Um, sorry. Okay. Briefly, the web history uh, could be divided into three basic phases. The first phase, usually referred as uh, Web 1, comprised the first steps of the web development. Then the available uh, content came from specific publishers and the final users, they were just receivers, just readers of the content. At the second phase, Web 2, anyone can uh, be a content uh, provider can publish content without the need of sophisticated infrastructures or programming skills. Phase one and phase two are considered as the web of uh, documents. The third, the third phase of the internet, web three, also known as a semantic web, is the main subject of uh, this presentation. It's currently under development and it is an extension of the web as we know it today. It focuses on how data should be published in a more in a most effective way for being machine readable and machine processable. An interesting point to share here is that the web of documents, that is the web one and web two, as is known until today, a search engine retrieve relevant web pages which the user is redirected for locating the answers to their questions. On the contrary, the semantic web, there can be direct answers, not just the directions to the documents holding these answers. Excuse me, I made a double click. But why focus on coding and representing data? Aren't they fine as they are? Unfortunately, the answer is no, because normally data come in form suitable for human perceptions like uh, text, uh, like uh, images, like sounds. Therefore, we need to make machines most clever for being effectively assistive in our lives, even if we are talking about uh, researching or uh, daily activities. To achieve effective processing of data, there are two fundamental approaches. The first one is to develop complex algorithms and techniques that analyze data in the form they originally exist. The alternative approach is to codify data in ways that they are better for facilitate its processing. The last approach is the basis on which the semantic web is built. SSHs are heavily relying on natural language, not because they study language, but because they use it both in the analysis process and documenting the results, the outcomes, the conclusions. Some researchers recommend parallel adoptions and implementation of more formalistic models. I agree with that perception. And why I agree? 
because machines have many problems with text. This problem is not only for social sciences. Codifying is difficult because everything on the entire web relies on text. The text is stored in various documents. That's the way we could call the current web, web of documents. And I would like to say a few things about the fundamental career of this web, of the current web, which is natural language. Computers cannot really understand texts. Basically, computers uh, really don't understand anything. Understanding is a skill beyond their powers. Sometimes effective processing of information leads people to think that the computer really understands. But computers don't like text in natural language form because they cannot uh, perform deductions from that. To do deductions, computers rely on data structures like databases, which allow a more effective processing. The problem of vagueness in natural language is not only a computer issue. Words in natural language are fairly vague. We need a lot of contextual information to interpret language. This means that lexical communication requires a large amount of tacit knowledge. Pinker, a famous linguist, asked the readers to consider how much knowledge of human behavior must be interpolated to understand what he means in a simple dialogue like this. A woman says, I'm leaving you. And the man responds, who is he? Let's think about it for a moment. How many meanings can we extract from this short dialogue? I'm leaving you, who is he? For actual understanding, we should know things about society, about genders, about relationships, and so on. I forgot to, to show you the, the quote of the Pinger. It's like, is this one. Let's try to limit the vast field of uh, language. And let's discuss a simpler example, focusing on relation of words and concepts. Words are very important for human communication because they refer to concepts. Wittgenstein was one of the first to study the subject. And uh, at first he suggested that is required to assign its concept to a different word. In the course of his studies, he reviewed his postulates after understanding that context provide the framework for words to acquire their meaning and be interpreted as a uh, concept. The graph appearing here, uh, I mean uh, on this slide, represents this way of thinking based on Wittgenstein later philosophical period. For example, the word but, as you can see on the screen, refer to the animal or to sports equipment, to a racket. If the word is used within a sentence, it's easy for a human mind, if interprets the context correct, to understand the concept which assigned the word. If I said the bat nurses its young, then you can understand that uh, I'm referring to the animal. Like we have already talked about, natural language required tacit knowledge and context to make sense. So it is, a, it is not a good tool to perform computational processing. As we will see, in the context of the semantic web, it is possible to represent entities in an unambiguous way, and then to declare the names by which these entities are known.
The problem here is how can we manage these entities in a computer? Are these entities going to be stuffed in a computer? Actually, there are two types of entities. The ones that can actually be stuffed in a computer and uh, others that uh, they cannot be stuffed in a computer. For example, a photograph or my voice as I speak can be saved in a computer. On the other hand, object of the physical world cannot do that. We cannot put a bat in a computer, I mean the animal. So Sova says that physical objects, events and relationships, which cannot be stored directly in a computer are represented by symbols that serve as surrogates, as surrogates for the external things. These symbols and the links between them form a model of the external system. So by, by manipulating the internal surrogates, a computer program can simulate the external system or reason about it. To make it uh, maybe more clear, you watch me now at this presentation and you can see me or hear me, but we all know it is not exactly me in the computer. It's an image and sound functioning as surrogates so you have the feeling that you are watching and hearing me. So in this case, the computer program simulates the external system. In this specific case, the external system, it's me. I am the external system. While the sounds you hear and the image you see are the surrogates. Okay. We made it. Through symbols, which function as surrogates, we can represent objects that exist in the natural world. But how about meaning? Can we have meaning in a computer? It is possible to have surrogates also for the meaning. If we assign an identifier to anything that makes sense for us. This means for its class, instance, or uh, property. In the context of the semantic web, these uh, surrogates obtain, obtain their meaning, not through natural language, but by the underlying formal modeling, depending on what these entities represent and how they are interrelated. Uh, I said uh, a lot of things about uh, semantic web and uh, web of documents and uh, things like that. I think it is uh, important to clarify the meaning of uh, this word, which used as synonyms or uh, quasi -synonyms, synonyms. The semantic web or Web3 is the goal for making internet data machine readable, meaning to encode information in a way that allows carrying the intended semantics, the intended meaning in a computer. The web of data is the aim to turn the web into a global database, meaning they create data structures that will be more uh, effectively processed, uh, processable by computers. And finally, linked data are the specifications, the properties and the rules for achieving the above goals. So there is a currently ongoing transition for the web of documents as we know it, to the web of data. And the basic mechanism to perform this, I'm sorry, I have a problem with my mouse, um, is RDF, RDFS, all, and things like that. I guess uh, this site contains many not defined uh, or uh, unknown words for you. I will speak about them uh, right now. RDF stands for Resource Description Framework. It is the most abstract model of the semantic web. RDFS stands for Resource Description Framework Schema, and it is used to apply more restrictions and provide a building mechanism to handle classes. We will see later what classes are. 
And all stands for web ontology, ontology language and other more formal means that al allows better expressiveness in order to achieve automatic reasoning. Keep in mind that every old ontology can be represented as an RDF graph. So, as we said in the previous slide, RDF is an abstract model. It is a W3C recommendation being in the center of the linked data ecosystem. And it is a precondition for their implementation. RDFS basic mechanism, RDF, excuse me, RDF basic mechanism is the creation of triples. Each triple comprises three elements a subject, a predicate, and an object. I think it's obvious that there is an analogy with natural language, where sentences tend to have a subject, a verb, and an object. For example, Manolis is giving a presentation, a word from natural language. Manolis is the subject, is giving is a verb, the predicate in the context of the RDF, and presentation is the object. In RDF, every subject is a resource identified by a URI. Predicates or properties, like the verb in natural language, is also a resource and also identified by a URI. And finally, the object can be either a resource identified by a URI or a literal value, which means just text, plain text. A collection a set, a sum of such triples, compose a direct graph. Now let's have a look at the structures of these triples, meaning the structural components of the semantic graphs. Oval shapes represent resources. Acres, meaning edges, represent uh, predicates, which means properties or relations, the verb in natural language. Rectangle shapes represent the values. I would like to pinpoint that values are not resources. They are text, numbers, dates, but not resources. I said that the word the resources uh, many times, but what the resources in the context of the semantic web and big data? A resource can be anything that we can talk about. And by anything, we actually mean anything. It could be an, it could be an object of the natural world, like uh, the desk uh, I'm sitting, the chair I'm sitting. It could be a conceptual object like the concept of love or uh, the concept of power or uh, the concept of power of love. It may exist in the real world, like a person, or may be a fictional character, a character from a novel. It may be true, like a real event, or uh, it may be rumors, or it may be something that uh, it's a known lie. In the context of the semantic web, resources, are not entities in the strict sense. Properties of these entities can also be defined as resources. Let's explore a very basic example of modeling in RDF. On your screen, you can see two oval shapes, which represent two resources. One is the URI from Wikidata, from the resource uh, Wikidata, Wiki, Q, A, 80, and uh, there are the resources from DBpedia, URI, resource London. The first resource, which is the identifier wiki Q80, is about a resource having the name Tim Berners-Lee. The property has name, which stands as the verb, is declared by the respective URI schema.org. There is another property assigned to the resource, which is the birth date, which declare 
which declares the person's date of birth. The second resource, meaning the URI from DBpedia, refers to the city having the name London, which is known as the capital of the UK. So it seems that we have four triples, which in physical language reads as entity with URI X, has named Tim Berners-Lee, who was born in 1955 in London. Tim Berners-Lee and London represented not by their names, but by, the, by their URIs. So in this way, we can define these entities in an ambiguous way. I'm gonna show you a little more complicated example. Like I mentioned earlier, at the beginning of, the, of this presentation, the semantic web is meant to be concept centric, not text centric or script centric. Its building blocks are concepts. So maybe a good example to understand is the simple knowledge organization system known as SCOS. Uh, it is designed to represent uh, thesauri and other, and other control vocabularies. Uh, uh, the main objective of this is to enable easy publication and uh, use of such vocabularies uh, as linked data. In the example we have here, we observe three concepts, three terms from different thesauri. From two different from two different thesauri, every dark blue oval shape corresponds to a concept, to a term. So, on the right, in the uh, I'm trying to pinpoint at the same time, but I don't uh, I don't know if I can see my pointer. Nevertheless. The concept down right is the term, the term library in English language or term bibliophiki in Greek language. The concept, concept uh, four, uh, uh, four, eight, six, five, has border concept, the one by the name in English information service, which is the concept uh, URI is uh, for, for uh, 366. As declared by the arrows pointing to the left of the side, these terms come from the official house called Eurobot. The term upright comes from another thesaurus named Gemet. An interesting feature here is that we can link the concept library service of Eurobot with documentary system of GEMET using the relations cost exact match. This means that despite the different names of these two thesauri, it's still the same concept. RDF is a necessary condition, but not sufficient condition to ensure linked data. I would like to show you an example uh, of a uh, good practice and of a bad practice. Both examples on this slide describe the Leonardo da Vin that Leonardo da Vinci is the creator of the Mona Lisa. But in the first case, da Vinci not stands as a resource, as an independent entity, but as a property of Mona Lisa. This is a really good, a really bad practice. It may be very easy to transform current data to a triple of the form resource, property, and then value. But in this way, the true power of RDF lost because the true power of RDF is the ability to use the triple resource, property, and resource, where its resource could be the subject or object to a new triple. That's exactly the problem of the first triple of this slide. 
The graph is not expandable. Da Vinci is not a separate and autonomous entity. The second option is not the, excuse me, is not the best practice, but still a good practice because we can expand this, uh, this graph. So far, we have talked mainly about the relationships between entities, but without declaring what these entities are, what are their types. In the semantic web and leaked data ecosystem, modeling can come in two different levels. The first level is about individuals or instances of the real world. The second level is about categories with this individual belong to. So once again, classes are categories while instances are the individuals of these classes. So the statement, James, uh, Jane drives her uh, automobile is considered a real world event while cars as a concept, as, as a category is the ability of the human mind to put in the same group individuals who share common characteristics. In the real world, there are no categories. Categories is a construct of the human mind. Obviously, not only of the human mind, also animals do categorize. A cat can recognize other cats, can handle what food is, what danger is, and stuff like that. RDF schema is the extension of the symbol RDF, which provide the mechanism to define the manage the classes, meaning the categories. And OWL provides further formalisms and restrictions, uh, which uh, could uh, perform better in uh, the domain of uh, expressiveness and precision. Therefore, in the linked data environment, we can manage both relations and properties of the entities and manage the relations and properties of the classes into which these entities belong. But why it is so important to have linked entities and assign them to specific categories? Because we can navigate in a semantic net network often called as knowledge graph. Linking provides extra information by adding context to the resource and thus uh, eliminates ambiguity. Linking allows connecting different resources from various sources. Linking allows applying dynamic modeling, allows describing and modeling activities, events, relations, not only objects. Linking allows connecting different descriptions of the same entity. In this way, many alternative representations of the same resource may apply and compare it to each other. But since the, the descriptions we create in this way are not from scratch, but they rely or link to descriptions of others. You will see some examples uh, in the next presentation with uh, Agathe Papanotti. There is a very important issue here, provenance and reliability of information. I believe uh, it is a fundamental uh, difference to say that I have found the video on TikTok uh, argues that the moon is a spacecraft than uh, referring to a relevant report uh, citing uh, official uh, NSA statement. In uh, this slide, there is an example from Google Scholar. If you search in Google Scholar for the ancient Greek philosopher uh, Aristotle, you will find you will find out that um, 
he has a verified uh, uh, email address at the Buffalo University. I think it's quite awkward. Is he a professor or a student uh, at Buffalo? I don't think so. So, Tim Berners-Lee, the person who invented the web and pioneer of the semantic web, introduced the graph up here in the slide called the semantic web stack. As you can see, at the top is the trust. In one uh, uh, of his interviews, Tim Berners-Lee referring to the semantic web and said that the web is now philosophical engineering. The semantic web is not a technical issue. As you can see on the top is the trust. The whole modeling is about trust. And trust comes through proof. Software and application being on the top of the, of the pyramid are going to build on trust. The gray areas on this graph, the core of the semantic web stack, stack was the focus of this presentation. We talked about RDF, RDFS, and OWL. RDF, RDFS, OWL is about interoperability, an issue that comes across the ecosystem of leaked data. Interoperability is the ability of a system to communicate effectively with other systems. It makes sure, it makes sure, excuse me, it makes sure that data are detached from specific, specific software. The data are meant to, 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 to have lasting value. Specific software is doomed to live very short life. So in order to let the data travel with us, we must reduce their dependency on specific software. Because once again, the data are of lasting value. Specific software is doomed to live a very, very short life. Leak data have many advantages and cannot be concluded because we are still on the making. Yet I will refer to some already known and uh, please feel free to add your own thoughts on the list. Link data are content agnostic. Link data are also software agnostic. Link data are shareable, inner and interdiscipline. The basis for the interdisciplinarity research and collaboration. collaboration. Link data are easily reusable, are also extensible, which means they have added value. They support multilingual functionality because they are language agnostic. Their approach is conceptocentric. They support modeling activities, allows dynamic description of complex phenomena. They are easy to transform to various visualizations to build the graphs, to transform them to HTML, etc. And uh, they are, uh, these um, visualizations are um, very suitable for uh, human eyes and human cognitions. They allow uh, automatic uh, reasoning and uh, allow researchers to describe with a high level of precision, which is usually not possible with natural language. So this is a completely new ecosystem that creates a new paradigm for social science and humanities. In this ecosystem, computers are not only for quantitative analysis, 
but new possibilities for uh, qualitative analysis arise. Also, new ways occur for sharing data and testing on data, which I think is very important. In this slide, there is an example for, uh, from the CDOCRM ontology. CDOCRM ontology is an ontology for cultural heritage, which is now an ISO standard. We see a series of uh, human agents, objects, and events, and how this occur in space and time. We will not, we will not talk in detail about this example. It would be take about 20 minutes to, to explain all CDOCRM related information. But I will make some uh, remarks. The axis X represents the space, the space, the space, the space, the space, while X is uh, Y represents the time. So we have some events which occur in specific space and specific time. It's a new way to tell a story because the true innovation and power of this representation is that this story is machine readable and machine processable and computer can process these events, persons, objects, and their relations and reason about them. That means inference. If you want to see, to find more details for this description and representation, uh, you can uh, look at the CDOCRM introduction version 7.1, uh, 7.1. I move on. So what is needed to implement linked data in the domain of social science and humanities? First, a new way of thinking. A new way of thinking, mainly emphasizing on conceptualizations and ideas, not exactly programming or artifacts or things like that. In thinking in a more abstract level. Then collaboration. Collaboration between researchers, collaboration between institutions. And uh, finally, interdisciplinarity, especially between computer, information science, and social science and humanities. In this way, it would be easy to develop uh, relevant uh, communities which could build uh, the appropriate infrastructure. We are uh, an event from Triple, and I think uh, uh, it is uh, uh, we are on uh, this way at the moment, uh, right now. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I had many, I have many technical issues here in this desk, but uh, I hope that it was, uh, it was easy to follow my, my thoughts. Thank you very much. Manuel, thank you very much for this uh, extremely interesting and stimulating presentation. Uh, thank you. Now I want to, to remind you to you all that you can uh, uh, put your questions in the chat or the Q&A section. Uh, as I said at the beginning, they are more than uh, welcome. So uh, please, if you want to ask something, you can use the chat or the Q&A section. So now we move to, to Agafi. As we said in the beginning, she will talk about uh, searchcalcio.cr as a, a case study of using uh, linked data in the uh, cultural domain, VSSH. So please, Agafi, uh, the floor is yours. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Agathe Papanotti. I am an archaeologist and information specialist at the National Documentation Center in Greece. Today I will introduce you to Search Culture GR, the, Greece, the Greek uh, cross domain cultural data aggregator, as a state of the art case for the use of linked data in the cultural domain. Uh, the emphasis will be on our recent enrichments uh, of uh, persons. 
So to begin, uh, search culture is being developed by the National Documentation Center in Greece, which is a national research infrastructure, an independent broader public sector body overseen currently by the Ministry of Digital Governance. One of our most uh, long-standing activities is aggregation. We developed Open Archive GR, the biggest scientific data aggregator in Greece, and Search Culture GR, the national uh, cultural data aggregator. Since its launch in 2015, it keeps growing in numbers and expanding its functionalities. Today, Search Culture GR has amassed more than 830,000 records from 78 institutions. Data ingesting uh, come from a variety of collections of uh, archaeology, folklore, history, arts and crafts, and span more than 7,000 years of Greek history. Search Culture GR is the accredited national aggregator of European. The portal offers a unified search uh, across all content, advanced uh, search and facets for filtering the results based on type, uh, subject, date, historical period, persons, license, collection, and language. Uh, browsing tools, curated thematic exhibitions. Uh, all the metadata are published as uh, linked open data and uh, the portal and basic metadata are bilingual. All these are possible due to the emphasis we pay on uh, enrichment processes. Metadata heterogeneity is a big issue for every large scale aggregator. The lack of, uh, use, uh, the lack of use of linked open data, different documentation methods, typos, and different metadata languages are just some of the issues that hinder uh, disco discoverability. For this reason, we conduct enrichments uh, on all our aggregated content. Uh, we began in 2016 with the types, and in 2017 uh, with the dates. In 2019, we conducted enrichments on subjects. To summarize uh, our enrichment methodology, we keep the source metadata intact and we clearly mark uh, the enriched fields. We design a collection specific enrichment methodology by configuring the mapping rules from the source metadata fields to the target vocabulary terms. We perform enrichments per distinct metadata value on the item types, subjects, temporal values, historic periods, and persons. We have developed our own bilingual vocabularies or we have used adapted, extended and translated existing widely used vocabularies. We link to popular vocabularies and resources and we follow a semi-automatic process heavily curated but supported by self-learning smart tools. As I mentioned before, we have created the four bilingual vocabularies that are linked to existing uh, widely used vocabularies such as the UNESCO thesaurus, Getty Art and Architecture thesaurus, etc. The enrichments conducted in item types, subjects, temporal values, and historic periods are a type of classification using uh, hierarchical vocabularies, allowing the curator some assumptions or generalization. For example, you can see here how three different values of types of photographs can be homogenized uh, with a general term photo from our vocabulary of types. But why use a linked open data vocabulary? The same could happen with a regular bilingual vocabulary or not. Not exactly. Let's see a particular example. The word icon refers to both a symbol or graphic representation and to a, uh, to a devo the devotional painting of holy figures. The label icon, to which kind of object does it refer to? Its linked open data vocabulary term includes some information that explains it, identifies it with the URI permanent identifier, and shows its relationship to other terms, sometimes, sometimes from the same vocabulary or other linked vocabularies and thesauri. In this example, we see the term icon from the uh, EKT vocabulary cultural heritage item types, its URI, broader and narrower terms, and the exact match with the term from the Getty Art and Architecture uh, Thesaurus. At the same time, this information is encapsulated in an RDF representation, for example, an RDF slash XML serialization or JSON. This makes the term machine readable. But what does this mean? 
It's time the unique URI identifier is included in a metadata record. It also carries with it all the relevant information of that term, as long as someone visits the URI to obtain its RDF representation. This extra information gives a better, more complete context for the documented item. The vocabularies were created in Semantics GR, a state-of-the-art multifunctional platform where one can create, curate, and publish linked open data vocabularies, thesauri, and authority files in any schema. The platform was created by uh, ECT. In uh, 2020, we tried to tackle the issue of metadata heterogeneity in personal names, and this is the process that I will uh, focus on uh, today. In the vast majority of our collections, references to persons are done with their names without any explicit identifying information. This makes the disambiguation process even more difficult and compels the curator to take into consideration other metadata, such as type, date, or even the cultural object itself, in case the person under scrutiny is somehow depicted. To that problem, we must add the issues of reviewing members of the same family, or another issue is that uh, that of synonymity is due to common surnames, such as uh, Rossi in Italy or Smith in the UK or Papadopoulos in Greece, as we will see later. And we also have to work with parent names, pet names, and even artistic nicknames. The enrichments conducted in persons have the element of, the, of this ambiguation and are much more demanding for the curator since its enrichment, uh, its enrichment rule potentially must be double-checked and in some cases researched. Let's see some examples. For the term King George, we can find the full disambiguation page in Wikipedia. And despite the fact that our content is Greek and uh, Greece had only two kings with his name, the lack of additional information, uh, identification requires some research for the curator to eliminate other kings, or even in our case, uh, in search culture, the King George Hotel in Athens. As far as commoners are concerned, this is another disambiguation page in Wikipedia for the surname Papadopoulos. Though it is the English version and thus less extensive, you will see that there are 13 football players with that name, as well as a dictator. So, Another issue we had to consider is that of the person's role in relation to a cultural heritage object. Uh, it varies a lot. It could be the director, the screenwriter, or the actor of a play, the sender, the receiver, or the subject of a letter, etc. The main problem is that many institutions do not clarify the role of a person, and most importantly, most of them provide their metadata in aggregation schemata that are based in Dublin Core, which lack the required expressiveness to distinguish these roles. In the current example, we can see a photograph of the renowned Greek photographer Nellis, and we can also see a list of person, personal entities that are related to this cultural object. A personal name will either appear in one of the two agent metadata fields, DC creator or DC contributor, or it will appear in DC subject or even in more descriptive fields such as DC title and DC description. To deal with all these limitations that I mentioned, we opted for creating only two separate fields, act creator and act referred person, thus conducting two kinds of person enrichments. These would be uh, the basic fields that will be used for person-driven search, browsing, and faceting. In this example, you can see objects whose creator is the Greek composer Mikis Theodorakis, either as a music composer or as a con correspondence writer. In this slide, however, you can see cultural objects whose relation with Theodorakis is that of a subject. He is the subject of a sketch, he is mentioned in a theatrical uh, production program, and he is depicted in an anti-dictatorship uh, anti poster produced in Holland. So taking into consideration all the former mentioned uh, parameters, we had to get to set some initial uh, specifications. We would focus on Greek persons from antiquity to today. Some non-Greeks were included because of their relevance to Greek history. 
we decided to focus mainly on persons who left some mark in Greek history, art, science, politics, and social life, and whose biographical information would be reasonably easy to access. We did not consider fictional characters such as Oedipus Rex or groups of persons like an artist's work, a workshop. The mechanism we used for our enrichment is the enrichment tool of Semantics GR. It is a tool for setting enrichment mapping rules from distinct metadata values to vocabulary terms. It allows for semi-automatic and self-improving enrichment processes. As I mentioned before, a vocabulary is essential in our enrichment process. Therefore, a big challenge was to come up with a vocabulary of persons with a critical mass of entries before the mapping process is started so as to cover our content as much as possible. The modern Greek visual prosopography is a collection of more than 12,000 digitized portraits of Greek men and women who have attained distinction in, in every sphere of life from the fall of Constantinople to the present day. Most records had biographical information on the featured person, such as the date of birth and death, occupation, etc. These entries were deduplicated because they referred to works of art, so some persons were mentioned several times. So from the 12,000 original records, we ended up with around 6,000 vocabulary entries. We decided to also add uh, in our records authorities of acclaimed art galleries databases, such as the National Gallery Alexandros Soutsos Museum and the Archive of, of Contemporary Greek Art Institute. Uh, this was the critical mass on which we expanded our vocabulary. The source we collected from were not linked open data. However, the vocabulary of persons is a linked open data vocabulary conforming to the EDM agent class of the Europeanas EDM. It was created and published in Semantics GR. To date consists of 8,273 persons. Each entry has a permanent URI identifier. It was enriched when possible with metadata regarding biographic information, bibliographic references, and links to established resources and other linked open data vocabularies, such as the Virtual International Authority file, Wikipedia, and IMDb. By linking our terms to other linked open data vocabularies, such as the VF, uh, the user, apart from our basic biographical information, will also get information regarding works, alternative names in other languages, and whatever else the relevant VF page includes for this individual. We created an additional vocabulary, the professions occupations. It is hierarchical and bilingual, and its terms refer to occupations such as merchants, doctors, military officers, noble titles, different social movements, etc. cetera. Uh, the terms of this vocabulary were used to classify entries in the vocabulary of persons and facilitated various search and navigation functionalities in our portal. Continuing with the enrichment process, locating the person information was a challenge in, in its own right. Here you can see some examples of where we detected the personal name of Odysseus Elitis the poet and Nobel Prize winner. In this record, his name is in the DC creator field. Here, he appears in a DC contributor field, which is not correctly form formed. You can see there are 11 contributors, all in the same metadata field value. The mapping tool supports automatic suggestion of, of mappings, uh, which by default is based on string similarity matching between original values and labels of vocabulary entries. Due to the different forms in which personal names are given, for example, the use of initials instead of fully given names, use of patronymics, etc., it was necessary to adapt the matching algorithm in order to be as effective as possible. As you see in the example, uh, the vocabulary value Eleftherios Venizelos will match with the first four names, but not with the last three. This is what the forms look like. There are several control panels regarding ingestion and form configuration. There are two main columns. On the left are the original distinct metadata values, and on the right are the personal entities that they are mapped to.
when the system detects a potential match to the uh, a potential match, the value is flagged as under validation. On the right part of the screen is the proposed match with the basic biographical and bibliographical information. In this example, the match is not the preferred label, but the alternative, which is the person's artistic nickname. The match is made because all the labels preferred and alternative are equally indexed. At the end of this process, the curator validates the mapping rule. And from now on, for this specific collection, all the records that have this creator value will be enriched with a linked open data term on the right. This is the most basic of processes as far as enrichments go. And I could be talking for hours for the different settings required in order to extract information regarding persons from various fields. However, there is a fascinating article regarding the enrichment process that you can find in publications page in Search Culture GR. Or if you speak Greek, there is a thrilling webinar in the same page. So this is how the enrichments are integrated in the item page. All our enrichments are in pink color, clearly marked, and separate from the original metadata. The linked open data enrichments are embedded in the items RDF slash XML representation. You can see the arrows. Here in the references field, the pink labels are hyperlinks that link that, that lead to all the records related, related to this person. And the semantic symbol leads to the full vocabulary entry with the biographical information. All our enrichments are used as search and browsing criteria, thus facilitating access to the items via different pathways and producing uh, targeted search results. Uh, the new search box allows users to retrieve cultural heritage objects based on creators or referred persons using a drop-down autocomplete list that presents entity name, a portrait, and biographical information. Another search field uh, using uh, a drop-down autocomplete uh, hierarchical list allows users to retrieve cultural heritage objects created by or referring persons of a selected professional occupation. The personal enrichments function as a filters for fine tuning the search results. In this example, I'm searching for drawings and I specifically want to see those created by the renowned Greek stage and costume designer, Georgos Anemogiannis. On the home page, an interactive navigation window displays a fraction of the persons as a tag cloud of the portraits. We also created a new search engine that targets the person entities in the aggregated content. Within this page, one can also search for a name while auto to complete is enabled. Alternatively, one can search by professions or birth year or a range of years or use those features as uh, facets. The resulting person entries include the thumbnail depicting the person, the name, key biographical information, the link to the person sent it in semantics GR, and external links uh, via Wikipedia, etc. On the right hand side, we see the number of cultural heritage objects the person has created, those that depict refer to him, her, or her, and the total number of cultural heritage objects re re relative to this person. The numbers are clickable, as you saw, and uh, direct to the relevant results page. The use of linked open data elevates a personal name from a simple label, gives it context, helps educate our users and create uh, valuable uh, connections in our content, as you see here from this example. And just because five different types of enrichments are not enough, we are currently working on enriching the spatial metadata of our content using GeoNames. 
This will allow us to develop search, browsing, and presentation functionalities on interactive maps. Here is a list of applications regarding an enrichment strategy and the use of linked open data vocabularies. You can find them in the publications page of Search Culture GR. This is the multidisciplinary team behind the aggregator who also contributed in the process of enriching persons. I invite you to use, uh, to, to, to visit Search Culture. And uh, thank you very much. So, Agathe, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation about how uh, you work on uh, searchcultures.gr. So I want to uh, remind you that you can uh, put your uh, questions in the chat um, or in the Q&A uh, section. Uh, you can ask uh, our speakers um, whatever uh, you want. I think that they are ready to answer to all your questions or uh, in any question that is uh, related to the presentation that they just made. Uh, so just, I would like to ask you, uh, Arafi, what is uh, the, the workflow of this, you know, the curation of this uh, metadata and the, the sources that is, this is an ongoing process, something that, you know, you collect new resources and the, this the curation is a uh, constant procedure, let's say. Yes, it is. I, well, oh, of course, uh, for the data we had already aggregated uh, uh, before the response, we had to go back and uh, enrich them. But now every new uh, a, a, every new collection that uh, gets uh, in uh, Search Culture GR uh, is uh, enriched uh, on all these uh, fields. And uh, of course, uh, if also when uh, old collections have uh, increased their numbers, uh, gotten new material, then we also enrich these uh, new items. Mm -hmm. So this is an ongoing process. Yes. So um, just waiting for our uh, you know, attendees to ask their questions, I would like to ask uh, Manolis about you know, this is the presentation you, you made us is about the, a, a work that is in the state of the art, if I understood correctly. So uh, I would like to ask you what, uh, you know, in what stage of this transition to Web3 you think, or, you know, people that work on this thing that we are, we are in the initial stage, we are just at the beginning or... Uh, are we reaching I, the end to this? No, no, no. Certainly not to the end. Um, some uh, domains uh, like um, uh, uh, information science and some uh, institutions like uh, libraries are uh, uh, making a lot of use of uh, these technologies. But um, other domains like uh, humanities or uh, social sciences, uh, they are in the very, very, very first steps to this uh, environment. So could you please elaborate a bit on, you know, since you talked about the, the SSH and the, the topic of this, uh, you know, webinar is linked data and the SSH is about qu qualitative analysis. What could be an example if something that... Uh, yes. Uh, I... I, the, there was a, a slide uh, from uh, CDOC CRM. Uh, yeah, well. We can, we can um, um, uh, represent history, for example, in a completely different way. We can, uh, computers uh, traditionally, uh, was about uh, performing calculations um, to uh, do metrics, statistics, and all this stuff. Uh, linked data allows uh, for uh, qualitative analysis because uh, we can um, uh, improve inference and uh, reasoning uh, through 
formalisms that uh, are suitable for uh, social sciences, especially social sciences. I am a social scientist, so I can assure that. Uh, and uh, for uh, humanities, I think so, because uh, I don't have uh, the background for the humanities, but of course they can help uh, uh, to organize their research and to publish their research in uh, different ways. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I see that we have a question in uh, the chat. Uh, how do you solve the problem of URIs becoming non-existent, server errors, uh, transition error shutdown, specifically in long term? I suppose this is for you, Agafi. Or I, it... I don't think it's a, uh. it's for me. I haven't. Yeah. I don't think they, uh, I faced this issue yet. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I can. I can say a <laughs> word about that. Uh, uh, we can use a redirect machine, so uh, we can redirect something to uh -huh. a service to to another service. So it's something that we can handle it. So I didn't see the the hundred of years in the end. Yeah, it's <laughs> definitely not for you. So there is another question uh, that many repositories provide their collections as leaked data, but unfortunately in Dublin Core based data models that lack exp expressiveness. Do you believe that this narrows the benefit of leaked data? Uh, switching to schema.org or SIDOC uh, CRM is a realistic option or is it too late? Uh... I think I could say a word about this. Um, there is a pa paper from um, Baker. Uh, in this paper uh, says that um, Dublin Core is pigeons for digital tourists. Uh, I think that uh, Dublin Core uh, can perform this and only this. Pidgin is a language, uh, if we don't share a common language, uh, we can use uh, uh, some words in the, the language that is like English, but it's not exactly English, uh, for a basic communication. So I think that um, uh, Dublin Core is for uh, just a very, very basic communication between different systems and not for um, uh, original uh, describing resources. That's my point of view. Yeah. Um, Agatha, would you like to add something to this or? Yeah, I mean, I of course it doesn't, it doesn't cover all the needs we have mm. uh, with linked data, but it's good to have it. If nothing else, <laughs> this is from the pra practical point of view. Until something better is established, I think uh, that's. Uh... But of course, uh, schema org is a better. It's yes, uh, of something more expressiveness, more expressive. Sorry, allows for more expressiveness. So you think that uh, Agathe linked data has made your work at, uh, you know, in this in search uh, culture dot gr. Uh, you know, more uh, effective, you know, to use uh, linked data is... The reason, uh, especially in the case of uh, persons, there isn't another way to disambiguate uh, people. I, 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 we could have created a basic vocabulary that would give a name and uh, perhaps some biographical information. But uh, apart from that, what? I, I, it wouldn't be a unique, a unique person, a, a unique co co concept, if we didn't use a linked open data. It would just be a label with just some more information. It, it, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't serve the disambiguation process. Regarding types and the subjects, it's the paradigm, the example I gave, uh, with uh, the icon or. Uh, uh, we uh, in Greek uh, used uh, another example with the uh, ostraco, which is either a seashell or a part of uh, pottery. 
And uh, the second example with the Ostracon is uh, even more um, uh, representative in, uh, in archaeology, let's say, where both these uh, artifacts can be found. And if we don't have a clear context of uh, what we're referring to, it's uh, much more difficult to, to describe something. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have uh, a bit of time. Uh, if uh, someone of the attendees wants to ask a question. Uh, so, Manolis, I like this idea about philosophical engineering. You know, you, you present it. So, I, I don't know if you could say a few words about this. It, it is not my idea. <laughs> um, yes, um, the point is that um, the knowledge linked data um, is a part of knowledge representation. And knowledge representation is um, uh, implemented um, through ontologies. Ontology is a word that comes from philosophy. Where in philosophy, ontology means um, uh, that we are um, talking about the existence of something. In information science, ontology means uh, what uh, can we describe, and not what it exists. So uh, I mentioned that resource could be anything. That is a philosophical issue because what we want to describe, I would like to create an ontology. So to describe uh, relations about the ancient gods. I don't have to prove that uh, Jews existed. Uh, that's, um, I think it is an important thing that helps uh, humanities to create uh, descriptions that are valid without uh, have to prove uh, the, the real truth of these statements. So uh, we have two more questions. Uh, this is uh, one, uh, one question in the same line, uh, which has a philosophical aspect. It goes to Manuel, special thanks for putting the semantic web in a philosophical context. Uh, so please allow a philosophical question. Imre Lakatos' discipline of Popper shows to me convincingly in his renowned book, Proofs and Refutation, that mathematics and perhaps also science sometimes progresses also by what he calls concept stretching, exploiting the ambiguity of natural language expression of concepts. So how do you think the semantic web with its focus on disambiguation will affect this, uh, this possibility. Um, there is a concept in the semantic web about concept drift. That means that the concept can, uh, could be changed uh, during the time. Uh, in the context of the semantic web, we must, um, set a threshold when this uh, change uh, take place and creates as much identifiers as much the changes so for every for every change we need a new identifier that's the only way to handle it we don't have another way in the context of the semantic web of course and another question from Nelson, uh, who wonders if semiotics, semiotics could help in that process improved by machine learning. Uh, regarding semiotics, he is considering signs of meaning that compound the representation of any object, which then gives place to words. <clears throat> if I understand correctly the, the question, um, Ontology and knowledge representation is a way that the human mind thinks and know the computer 
performance. So if we decide that um, these are the appropriate classes and uh, these are the attributes of these classes, uh, we don't have any problem to uh, make a modeling like this. Uh, it, it is compatible to semantic web modeling. Uh, okay, so uh, I don't see any question in the chat. If you want, uh, you can ask, we have a few more minutes, you can ask a question. Uh, and if this is not the case, we, you know, we tried uh, our speakers uh tried to and i think they did this uh, convincingly to, to um to focus on uh, leaked data ah sorry there is another question from hiking to agathi uh, your metadata enrichment with uh, LOD should possibly affect also external access to your data in search culture.gr eg from googling have you seen any increase in uh, such external uh, traffic lately? Uh, to be honest, I don't. Uh, I I don't uh, really check the <laughs> the traffic. I have to do the enrichment, but uh, yeah, it, probably it should. Uh, this is uh, the logical thing. Uh, it's uh, probably the, it contributes to increasing the uh, the visits to our uh, aggregator. I, 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 to be honest, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. It is possible. Yeah. Okay. Well, so uh, I was uh, telling that the link data, I think it's a very interesting topic, which attracts the interest uh, of uh, people who work on this uh, field. So we had a large number of uh, attendees in this webinar and we attempted to uh, our speakers attempted and as I said they did it convincingly to um, <clears throat> uh, you know to see this uh, topic from a more theoretical let's say in abstract level as Manolo did and more practical in a case study uh, as Agathe did I think uh, and they combined these two aspects uh, in a very effective way. Uh, so thank you both, uh, Agathe and Manoj. Thank you very much for um, for these nice presentations. And thank you all for uh, all the participants of the attendees for coming here in this virtual room uh, to watch uh, this webinar. Uh, as I said, this webinar is has been recorded. Uh, we will upload it and uh, in the EKT uh, webpage and in the Triple uh, Project webpage, so uh, that you can uh, watch it afterwards if you like. Uh, I think that we can end this webinar now. Thank you again, the the speakers and all the the attendees. So. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.